Okay. This is a very great moment. As I told uh, before the sermon, uh, when I introduced Dr. Uh, Zavir, next year is 130th anniversary of this church and also Korean Protestantism. So that even though our number is uh, small here today, but very significant figures are gathering here uh, to listen to uh, Dr. Zavir's lecture. It's, it's about a mission. Uh, the title is Christian Missions in the 21st Century, uh, Building the Kingdom of God for All. Uh, sounds like a paradigm shift uh, in understanding uh, missiology. Uh, it's, uh, Dr. Zabia uh, worked for the church at the local church uh, for more than 20 years. So as church leader and also uh, distinguished administrator. He was appointed, he was uh, elected as the Dean of uh, Drew Theological Seminary, uh, particularly in this very uh, significant time of uh, uh, Christian history, uh, not only for the world but also for Korea, so that it is really meaningful time for us to have him as our speaker. Today we will not translate into Korean, but uh, for the Korean speaking congregation, we translated it so that you can read through in Korean version. And after his lecture, uh, we will have a time to uh, have some dialogue uh, with Dr. Zabia. In that time, you can ask uh, the questions in Korean, then I will stand as a translator for, for him and for you. Uh, without any interruption, uh, uh, I want to start uh, right away. So uh, uh, we welcome him with our hands, Dr. Xavier. Uh, Good afternoon. Let me just say before I begin um, that what I what I'm going to talk with you about, and I, and, I, and I use that phrase very intentionally, because I want this to be um, really a conversation, but what I'm going to speak about is I, I'm very aware that I'm speaking out of a very Western perspective, and so what I'm going to be laying out is how I interpret the, the situation of mission and missiology coming out of the Western perspective. But what I would hope is that at the end, afterward, that in our conversation, more than a question and answer, I hope it's a conversation, that you will help me um, learn about the context in the Far East, because it's probably very different. And I don't want, I don't want you to hear my comments as assuming that what, what I understand makes sense in the Western context automatically makes sense in the Eastern context. So help, help me learn today and be in dialogue with me. I would very much value that. So let's begin. In his, uh, in his recent book, which documents the, the fate of some of the most ancient religious traditions in the world, in the Middle East, Gerard Russell paints a very bleak picture. A scholar and historian of these movements, Russell describes in harrowing detail the evisceration of such ancient people as the Yazidis, who are presently under direct attack from the extremist group known as ISIL or ISIS. Yeah, is this familiar news here as well? Yeah. So it's, it's daily in, in our front page of newspapers and the leading story um, on our newscasts. And so the image of the Yazidi community isolated on a solitary mountain in northern Iraq, surrounded by ISIS rebels, intent on it destroying their way of life, their religious traditions, and even the very people themselves, has made headlines around the world. For me personally, as I know it has for others, it has been heartbreaking and even heart-wrenching to watch this situation unfold. But the Yazidis are not alone in their predicament. Even if their situation is the most dramatic and urgent at the moment, the Samaritans, an ancient biblical people, 
who are still centered in present-day Nablus in Palestine, the ancient biblical city of Shechem, are also under the threat of disappearance. The descendants of the northern tribes of Israel, whose ritual center was the altar at Mount Gerizim, their tradition preserves some of the most ancient forms of Judaism, not to mention some of Judaism's earliest and most sacred text. And they still offer the same tem temple sacrifices as those tribes offered during biblical times. The rival worship center of Jerusalem temple on Mount Moriah to the south, the Samaritan religious practice and devotion has changed very little since those earliest times. Jesus himself knew of the Samaritan traditions and one of his most famous parables involves the good Samaritan who exemplified the kindness of God. Today they too are near extinction with only about 750 Samaritans remaining in their homeland. Coptic Christians in Egypt struggle daily to survive and preserve their religious traditions. The most ancient Christian communities in the Middle East are daily diminishing due to persecution or migration. Druze in Israel, Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon are barely holding on. Zoroastrians are now almost entirely unknown in their original ancestral homelands in Iran and Iraq. All of these groups, all of these groups and others are under constant assault either because of attacks against them, pressures to assimilate with the predominant religious traditions around them, or because of mass migration to other parts of the world where they can live peaceably and safely. What is not yet known, however, says Russell, is whether when scattered around the world, they will be able to survive with their own unique identity or if over time, the diminished sense of community will predict their eventual disappearance. Russell likens what is happening in the Middle East to the story of Leonard Woolley, an archeologist who discovered a most beautiful piece of wooden sculpture that, that had, um, hold on, my pages are out of, out of sync here. Voila. <laughs> a wooden uh, sculpture that had survived thousands, thousands of years in the desert sands. But then when excavated, Woolly, Woolly excavated it and it began to rain. And with that exposure, Woolly literally, literally saw that ancient wood craft disappear right before his eyes in his very hands. And this precious piece of art preserved for millennia in a matter of minutes was destroyed because of its exposure to the world beyond its protective setting. The image of this disintegration of that precious relic is what Russell likens to the current reality of these minority religious traditions. And so I ask, what is lost? What is lost if this actually happens? What will it mean for the world to lose its most direct and living connection to its ancient past? Certainly many ancient societies and religious traditions are by now long lost to us. And we can never fully understand what that has meant for the development of the human race while the violent loss of human life and the suffering imposed upon these communities of religious minorities in the Middle East is not an acceptable reality, certainly, certainly that can't be up for debate, right? I do wonder if we would feel the same way about the loss of religious traditions other than our own. It's an important question for Christian missions. As part of the history and legacy of the Christian missionary movement is the conversion of peoples from their native or ancestral religions to the faith and community of Jesus and his spiritual descendants. For some, it's a pious goal to convert as many 
people as possible away from one particular tradition to the tradition we now call Christianity. And for them, it would be a wonderful occasion to celebrate the disappearance of those other traditions in favor of a universal embrace of the Christian faith. While what is happening in the Middle East today is vastly different from the work of Christian missionary conversion, the potential outcome is the same. What do you make of that? I'll give you a chance to answer later, but what do you make of that? I want to suggest that the loss of those traditions is tragic. And I say this not for historical, political, sociological, or anthropological reasons. It's tragic for theological reasons in addition to perhaps those other ones. But I want to focus on this one. And let me explain. I've been a Methodist pastor, as I've shared, those of you who may have been here for the sermon, um, for 20 years. Leading from my earliest days in ministry, mission teams throughout the United States and the world. Prior to leading these teams, I was a participant in many such mission experiences with local congregations where I was a member. In anticipation of this lecture, I counted the number of mission trips that I have either led or participated on over the course of my career, and the total surpasses 100. So I, I say that because I want you to know that the work of missions has been very central to me, to my, to my work as a pastor, to my life as a Christian. And I'm proud of that work even as my sense of what missions are about has evolved and changed over the course of my professional life. And I share this with you so that you're aware that as I talk about why I think that the loss of these other religious traditions is tragic, I do so as someone who has worked hard at spreading the Christian message and sharing the hope of the gospel with as many people as possible throughout the world. I believe deeply in bearing witness to the life and teachings of Jesus. But the how and why of that work has changed and evolved as a result of my experience of encounter and dialogue with people who do not share my same spiritual tradition or convictions. Now I said earlier that the loss of these traditions is tragic not only because of the violent way in which it is happening, but it's also tragic theologically. And I make this claim for two reasons. The first, the goal of mission work is not to convert people to Christianity. The goal of mission work is to bear witness to the kingdom of God among us. And I want to say some, something about that. And I recognize that this claim may sound contradictory to the departing call of Jesus to his disciples in Matthew's gospel when he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That verse alone has been the rallying cry for many missionaries to go to the farthest regions of the globe in order to convert others to Christianity. But it is important to note that conversion in this sense is not simply participation in a church. Rather, it is a call to a new and wholly different way of life, the way of Jesus. And the way of Jesus is not about doctrinal purity or correctness. It's not about membership and participation in a church, even though this can be a very good and important thing indeed. The way of Jesus is about living a life committed to the justice he proclaimed for all of God's people. It's a call to construct a world where, in the words of Isaiah and then eventually Jesus, we proclaim good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, where the oppressed go free and we proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
This is the kingdom of God that both the Old and New Testaments describe. And it is to that work that Jesus commissioned his disciples. When people are baptized, that is the life and work that they're baptized into. When Jesus says, teach them to obey everything that I have commanded, this is what he's referring to. When that is the purpose of our mission, then our purposes are aligned with Jesus' purposes. As Paul Knitter has pointed out, a missionary who has no baptisms to report, but who has helped Hindus, Buddhists, and Christians live together lovingly and justly is a successful disciple of Christ. A missionary who has filled the church with converts without seeking to change the, a society that condones dowry deaths or bonded labor or human exploitation is a failure. Now this is not to imply that conversions are not important. Indeed they are insofar as they help advance the very nature of the kingdom of God, which is characterized by God's love and justice. God's commitment to the poor and the least, God's desire that we live at peace with our neighbors and that we love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. This is how Jesus talked about the kingdom, isn't it? And this is the discipleship that he expected of his followers when St. Peter sought to retaliate against the Roman legionnaires in Gethsemane. Jesus reprimanded him, ordered him to put his weapon away, and healed the damage that Peter had inflicted. Jesus' way was intentionally different from the competing ways of the world, and that is the way, the way to which even St. Peter had to be converted. When Jesus asked him repeatedly, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? He was asking Peter a much larger question that did not, that did not involve any sentimental feelings of affection that Peter may have had for Jesus. Jesus is really asking Peter, this is what he's really asking Peter, do you love me enough to love the kingdom that I have come to proclaim, to teach, and to initiate? Do you love me enough to love that kingdom? Do you love me enough to be willing to die for the sake of that kingdom? See, Jesus called him to be a missionary for the kingdom of God. Later, Peter would once again have to confront the challenges of living this way of Jesus. In Acts 15, he goes through the excruciating process of deciding whether or not the kingdom of God was expansive enough to include those who didn't pr practice or believe exactly like him. And he wondered whether the fledgling church could bear this lack of uniformity. And this was perhaps the most critical moment in the earliest days of the Jesus movement. And though initially a very difficult decision, Peter and the other disciples conclude that to be a follower of Jesus did not require uniformity of practice and belief. Unity and uniformity are two very different things. Uniformity does not necessarily produce unity. For uniformity is centered on external realities. Uniformity does not require conversion. It simply requires adherence. In this sense, uniformity is ultimately a frail existence. And the history of the world is polluted with failed political, social, and religious movements and experiments that insisted on uniformity. Yet unity, unity, is a spiritual or a mystical quality that reflects an inner conversion to a deeper and larger truth. Unity, unlike uniformity, requires prayer, discernment, and open consideration of what matters most and what binds people together. 
Thus, true unity can actually thrive without uniformity. It can thrive with a diversity of faith and practice because its shared purpose transcends the simple regulation of others' behaviors and choices. If the motivation of our missionary work is to bear witness to the kingdom of God, to the reign of God's intent in our world, then our focus becomes less about the numbers of converts that we enroll in church programs, and it is more focused on the transformation of the world as Isaiah and Jesus envisioned it. Neither Isaiah nor Jesus taught a faith of uniformity. They proclaimed a faith of justice because they knew a God of justice. They were primarily concerned with the fate of the poor, the vulnerable, the hurting, the sick. This was the measure that they used to determine the health of the people's relationship with God. The God they worshipped was determined to establish a reign where all of God's people would live in peace, harmony, and justice with one another. And thus the primary work of God's people was to make that kingdom a reality. Now, this does not make conversion to Christianity obsolete, nor does it imply that the church is unimportant. The opposite is actually true. The church becomes the necessary expression of what the kingdom of God will be. If there aren't tangible examples of this kingdom, then it remains only an idea only a utopian dream. But if the church gives visible expression of the justice, love, and peace of God, then it is fulfilling its mission and its purpose. If in the church people find release from captivity, food for their hungry bodies, clear visions for their lives, liberation from the oppressive chains that bind them and their societies, then we see that the church is indeed necessary and crucial to the future flourishing of God's vision of the kingdom. Let's be very clear. Let's be very clear. All of our mission work as Christians ought to serve the telos or the goal or the end of God's kingdom for it is what the prophets described and preached. It is what Jesus longed and called for. It is what the early martyrs died for. And thus, it is the primary purpose of the church. The church serves the kingdom, not the other way around. Okay, that's just point one. Point two is a little more brief. The second point, the religious other people who hold different religious beliefs or convictions and practices from our own. The religious other enables us to live faithfully Jesus' great commandment to love God and neighbor. Again, that may sound surprising, but the term neighbor in biblical usage has, much, has a much more expansive sensibility than mere proximity. While it can certainly mean that the person who lives next door, its intention and implication is much broader. Neighbor implies other, stranger, foreigner, immigrant, servant, even enemy. Do you see the call to love is vast. Again, at no point in the biblical narrative is there an expectation of or call for a uniformity of faith and practice for all the world's peoples. There's no call, for example, to convert the Israelites' ancient Near Eastern neighbors to their own spiritual and cultural traditions. Even the New Testament, even the New Testament hymn of praise that declares, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even that him assumes not that this is a missionary call to convert, 
Rather, it is the conclusion of Paul's call to humility and which begins by instructing the Christians. These are the verses right before what I just read. Listen to what Paul says right before that. He says, regard others as better than yourselves. Furthermore, it is an eschatological vision in which God will eventually bring about God's desired purpose in human history. That vision is the work of God. Now this is significant precisely because the call to love is so demanding and challenging. Part of our checkered missionary past is the desire to remake our neighbor, regardless of how we define the word, into our own likeness, especially with regard to the beliefs and practices of their faith. And this has the effect of making it easier for us to love our neighbor because increasingly our neighbor is more like us. Does that make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? So if we can make them more like us, then it's easier to love them. Yet this isn't the biblical assumption at all. Jesus himself says that it's easy to love those who love us and who are like us. But remember what he says. But I say, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who mistreat you. The discipline of love that Jesus called his followers to live is not only rigorous, but it presumed an other, different, and at no point assumed the uniformity that I mentioned earlier. And so that presumption implies certain respect for and appreciation of who the other is. The other is worth loving simply as they are, and that expectation is inviolable. Inviolable. Furthermore, the prophet Micah gives us a challenging vision of the reign of God that we've been describing. In Micah chapter 4, there's a description of the day when God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. It's a description of all the nations of the earth gathering on Mount Zion. And listen to what occurs. This is what, this is what Micah says. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not take up sword against nation. They shall never again know war. But all persons shall sit under their grapevine or fig tree with no one to disturb them. For it was the Lord of hosts who spoke. Though all the peoples walk each in the name of its gods, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Reflecting on this text, Marjorie Hewitt Suchoki has said, the people return to their own place, bringing with them the knowledge gained from Israel's God. Because of this knowledge, they change their ways in the direction of peace, but they continue to follow their own religions. In today's language, they entered into dialogue and were changed by the dialogue, even while they remained themselves. And the Jews in the text likewise remain themselves more deeply than ever. We will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. See, I think that's as beautiful a description of Christian mission as I've ever heard. Today, we are being called to dialogue with our neighbors, to learn from them, even as we offer them the best of our own tradition. Perhaps the dialogue will lead to mutual learning and appreciation. Perhaps it will lead to a growing friendship and a deepening investment in the mutual, well, in the mutual well-being of the other. This sort of engagement will certainly honor the God Micah describes. It may even lead to conversion one way or another. Whatever it leads to, our goal in such engagements as Christians is the proclamation of the kingdom and bearing witness in our lives to that kingdom in the church's life and message. 
integrity of life, integrity of our individual lives, is the most powerful way to evangelize for this kingdom. And so in closing, I return to that barren, bleak scene in the Middle East with our Yazidi brothers and sisters surrounded and struggling for their lives. It's hard for me to imagine that if Jesus were still walking those very sandy roads, he would not be outraged if he happened upon that disturbing scene. And as we think about our own journeys along the sandy roads the gospel calls us to walk, let us be equally disturbed by the injustices and violence of the world, but more importantly, let us commit ourselves to the work of bringing the kingdom of God and its peace and justice to all of God's people in every corner of the world. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. Yes and no. I guess I would, I would, on, I would answer it this way. They, they, they did innovate for sure. But then there's the part of the other side of that historical record is that they were pushed out as well. So it wasn't simply that they innovated and created something new. There was a real um, struggle in those early years of, of the, you know, the, the new century um, about what a real debate that actually thrived and flourished about what it meant to be a faithful Jew. And increasingly, you know, mainline, uh, orthodox, and I don't mean orthodox the way we say orthodox today. I mean, what's a better word? Standardized majority Judaism determined that the way that they were practicing was not consistent. Did you need to translate the question? I'm sorry. 지금 이제 질문이 어떤 질문이냐면은 그 예수님께서 그 십자가에 달리시고 고통을 당하신 거가 그 유대 전통 속에서 새로운 일을 하셨기 때문이 아니냐 이제 이런 질문을 하셨어요. And so I think that to come back to the question was was Christ a Christian? I think that um, that to say that is is historically troubling because Christian, as, as you're, I think you're referring to it, is a historical construct that comes much later. Um, and so what I don't think that when we use the term Christian, it is something that in those earliest days of the movement, they would have recognized. It's not something that existed. It was, they were, you know, as we know, the earliest Christians were at synagogue on the Sabbath, and then on Sundays would gather. That understanding of what we call Christian evolved slowly over a period of time and even, you know, a couple hundred years. It wasn't as settled as we think it was. So it's complicated. Mm -hmm. But I, what I would say is that I, I don't think that, um, 
that it's fair to say that Jesus wasn't, I mean, that, that his own life was inconsistent with what we now call Christianity. I, that I would, I would have a bit of resistance to. I think that he very much would, um, even if his form and practice of it might be different than what we have done with it. 이제 기독교를 얘기할 때 예수님께서 활동하실 때는 기독교란 이름이 없었죠. 그러니까 이제 뭐 100년, 200년 후에 그런 이름들이 탄생이 됐고 그리고 지금 이제 예수님께서 사셨던 삶을 오늘 우리가 이렇게 얘기할 때 오늘 기독교가 이제 2000년이 지난 다음에 형성된 지금의 기독교의 입장에서 봤을 때도 어, 많은 그 가르침과 공동체를 가지고 있는 이 교회와의 그 교회의 가르침과의 이 거리감을 우리가 느낄 수가 있죠. 슈어. Sure. 지금 이제 말씀하신 거는 이 belief라고 하는 그 영어 동사가 보통 이제 믿음 체계 이렇게 이제 한국말로 번역이 되는데 
19세기 혹은 그 근대를 거치면서 어떤 그, 그 지성적인 동의 이런 것들을 이제 믿음 체계 이렇게 이제 시, 에, 이해를 했었는데 우리가 이제 신앙생활을 할때 중요한 것은 어, 내가 어떤 그 어, 지성적인 동의가 아니고 내가 어떻게 그리스도가 가르쳐준 삶을 사느냐 이런 거에 그 초점을 맞출 때 우리가 이제 그 컨시스턴트리 이렇게, 이렇게 일관성 일관성 있게 정말 그 기독교인의 그 그리스도의 메시지를 우리 가운데 적용할 수 있다 이런 얘기고 첫 번째 말씀하셨던 것도 이제 같은 맥락에서 말씀해 주신 겁니다. And then I would just say that I mean I think that um, you know we can certainly look at other aspects of scripture and I want to be careful not to do this because we're going to get into the the look at this scripture and look at that scripture but we know that there are instances where Jesus himself uses the witness of others who were different than him I, just using the Samaritan as an example and he upholds the Samaritan who had a very different way of belief in that parable it is the Samaritan who is the example of the father of God um, and 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 uses that person as what we are to emulate and and live ourselves so what do we do with that it's complicated it's very complicated 그러니까 뭐 어떤 특정한 인종이라든지 어떤 특정한 교리라든지 이런 걸 가지고 이제 기독교 분들 얘기가 어렵다는 거죠. 그래서 이제 사마리아 사람의 비유를 통해서 정말 그 우리가 그 서로 다르다 할지라도 중요한 것은 기독교의 본질이 그리스도의 그 근본적인 가르침이 뭐냐. 그래서 오늘 강연 중에서도 이제 컨버전이 중요한 게 아니고 하나님의 나라의 그 메시지, 그 위트니스가 되자 이런 얘기하면서. 그 love, justice, and peace 이걸 얘기했잖아요. 그러니까 kingdom life를 사는 거가 중요한 것이지 에, 그런 거에 이제 에, 포커스를 맞춰서 말씀해 주신 거죠. And then the last thing I'll say on this is that I don't think um, and it's important to me that this be clear that that what I'm arguing for should not in any way dampen or diminish um, the the um, our Christian. Belief, practice, and witness. I think, if anything, it calls us to an even deeper one, right? Because the integrity of our lives, um, this is what I was saying at the end, it's the integrity of our lives and the consistency with which we emulate the life of Jesus that, that is the best um, way of witnessing to the larger world. Unity is really important word. We understand unity is in diversity, so that it is a crucial term, uh, particularly in a pluralistic society like uh, Korea. Uh, it's a really wonderful term. But when we do mission uh, uh, in a Christian name, uh, ultimately, aren't we seeking for uniformity? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. I think, um, I mean, again, I guess I just, I think the, the, the example that I gave, you know, at, at Micah in the end, um, you know, is that that did not, that was not a vision of uniformity. Um, I do think, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I think the last part of the book, 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 그 하나님 나라의 비전 또 미가 선지자의 비전은 그 유니포미티가 아니라는 거죠. And I think that um, in the end, and this gets back to the question you asked about righteousness. Even if you go to the end of of 
the New Testament, the vision of Revelation at the end, um, you know, you, you see that people there, what, what's being, what is being, uh, that vision, at the heart of that vision, is the purifying of God's people, right? And, and of, of God's people being made holy as they, as they enter the very presence of God. And how that goes about, I, I don't have the exact answer or the formula for it, but there isn't a sense that they lose who they are. What they are, however, is just it's made right in the presence of God. And that is the work of God. I don't know that that is the work that we can determine for God. That, that is the work of God. What we can do is bear witness to the truth that we have received. Um, but the making of people righteous, it seems to me, is the work of God. 이제 우리가 계시록의 어떤 그 종말론적인 비전 속에 나타나는 것을 보면은 우리가 이제 그 하나님 앞에 하나님의 현전 앞에 우리가 이제 그 거룩하게 돼서 정화돼서 하나님 앞에 나아가는데 우리가 그 우리가 하나님 앞에 나아갈 때 이전에 우리가 이렇게 이제 그 잊혀지는 거죠 우리의 이전 것들이 근데 그것은 하나님의 방법이라는 거죠 그래서 우리가 지금 이 땅에서 해야 될일 가운데 하나는 하나님으로부터 받은 그 진리의 삶을 어, 살아주는 것 에, 이것으로 이제 말씀을 하십니다. 제가 다 이렇게 기억을 못하는 부분이 있는데 혹시 모자란 거 있으면 좀 중간에 보충해 주세요. 예, 이렇게 박, 이렇게 하시고 한 번만 더. 예, 이렇게 두분 하시면 아마 시간이 될것 같습니다. 예. 에, as a lay person, <웃음> it sounds like very difficult to evangelize uh, people even in the uh, same community and same cultural uh, atmosphere uh, so that uh, any secret, any, uh, any way for you to evangelize people as a Christian. Hmm. I want to make sure I understand the question. Uh, Meaning Okay. I'm not sure I understand. Uh, did I translate clearly? Yeah, yeah, mission, yeah, mission, yeah. As we, we sent a missionary to the foreign countries, but mm -hmm. uh, within a same cultural uh, setting, like uh, China and Japan, or, or also in Korean, mm -hmm. even uh, Korean to Korean, mm -hmm. not easy to uh, to the mission, uh, so that uh, any any good way for you to uh, uh, do mission and to evangelize? Yeah, yeah. Well, and and I guess I want to remind. Uh, I think it's helpful to remember that, as I said in, during my talk. I mean, this is what I've I've spent a lot of my own life. I mean, and so when you hear me saying what I'm saying about Christian missions and evangelization, I mean, I, I it's you know this is something I've struggled with. I'm not criticizing it. I've I've been engaged in it for a very long time and so I'm speaking as someone from the inside not from the outside that's just important for me to remind us of again um, but 근데 이제 그 교수님께서 말씀하시고 싶은 거는 이제 자신이 이런 그 선교나 이런 전도에 그 인볼브 안 되고 이렇게 얘기하는 게 아니고 자기는 정말 오랫동안 이 일에 그 관여하면서 사실은 내면에서 나오는 이거 이거 가지고 그 고통스럽게 고민하고 생각했기 때문에 그 내면에서 나오는 이야기지 밖에서 가지고 있는 얘기를 하는 얘기가 아니라고 하는 걸 먼저 말씀드렸었어요. Um, but I think that the way that I would answer what I think your question is 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 there a way to do this at home? I would say two things. One is I can't presume to know how to do mission and evangelism here. Mm. 
I think that you could probably teach me more than I could teach you mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> um, because I, this is in a context that is, is my own and that I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. But I'll let you translate that. 그러니까 이제 그거는 이제 그 교수님께서 저한테 가르쳐 주셔야지 제가 이 한국 세팅에서 제가 가르칠 수 있을 거라는 상상할 수 없다고 저를 가르쳐 달라고 그러시고요. 그 다음에는. But what I would say in addition to that is that whatever mission and evangelization looks like here, as well as in the West, in New York City where I am, it has to be about going back to Jesus' words and Isaiah's words. That whatever our work is, it has to bring release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, liberty to those who are oppressed, um, hope for those who are hopeless. Um, you know, that's the kind of work. It has to be liberating work. It can't simply be about getting people to say some words with their mouths. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, if, it, if we're just trying to get people to say something with their mouth, but yet they go back to their reality and nothing changes, then I don't understand what the point of our work is. Mm -hmm. It has to be liberating. It has to transform and change a world that does not reflect the glory and the intention of God.
이 지금 질문하신 것도 예. 질문하신 것도 밖에서 온게 아니고 내면에서 큰 스트로크를 하고 낸 질문이세요. 하나는 이제 그 앞에 일본 그 저기에서 강연 중에서 그 개종을 시키는 것과 그 하나님 나라의 증인이 된다라고 하는 증인의 삶을 산다는 것과를 이렇게 나누었는데 그 나누는 것에 대한 그 질문을 하셨고요. 그 다음에 이제 두 번째는 그 강연 녹 중에 그 원수를 사랑하라 그랬는데 정말 중요한 질문이죠. 원수를 사랑할 수 있을까? 예, 한번 좀 들어보시죠. 네. Here's why I think that the distinction is important. Um, and, and, the reason, and you say that it's a waste of time. Um, but I think that perhaps you, you can reach that conclusion because you, there, there are certain assumptions already laden in that. But to say that, um, here, here's, the, here's the best way I can do it. You can only make the claim that's not important if you already believe certain things, right? Which we all do. But if you read Paul, even Paul, look at, if you go to the end of Romans, even Paul makes a, this eloquent, beautiful case for Christ, right? But then when you get to chapter 11 and chapter 12, he's already making the case that will, you know, what will happen to Israel? Will Israel be lost? Will Israel have to, and he says, by no means, by, over and over again, he says, by no means, Israel remains Israel. And that the faith of Israel is important for, the, for if God is to be faithful, because God made a covenant with Israel, right? And God cannot turn God's back. So here's the, here's the risk. And as an economist, you know, there's always risk that if Israel is an exception, right? If God cannot turn God's back on Israel and Israel does not then have to go the same route that we all do, then what does that mean for others, right? For traditions that were unknown, say, you know, the, the Bible has no knowledge per se of Buddhism, for example, or Taoism. It's a, it's a world structure that's just out of, out of the biblical mindset. Um, so what I would say is that our way in the world is the way of humility, right? And, and I, don't, I don't have the answer to your question that we must, you know, demand or require that. I, I think that, that Jesus was a little bit more humble than that and, uh, and that, you know, that's the way. And, I'm, and your second question was, um, what was the second question? Uh, the, love your enemies. Oh, lo do we have to love their way of life? And here's what I would say, absolutely not. Insofar as, um, you know, certain ways of life are in opposition to the values of the kingdom of God. But we also know that, you know, when, when Jesus went into Gentile lands, you know, he b saw much that he praised in those, in those areas. And so I think that for the work for us, the work of missions is tricky. It's, it's not a science, it's an art. And that what we have to negotiate constantly is where, it, where is God being made known to us in this context and what stands in opposition to, and that's the work that we're constantly navigating and trying to figure out. I don't think that there are hard and fast rules um, that, that we say this is always the case with regard to this and this is always the case with regard to that. It's just more complicated than that. And, and knowing that, I want to approach it in a spirit of humility rather than a, a, in the spirit of exactitude. Well, I don't want to do it. I want to do it in a way of doing it. It's a matter of fact. It's a matter of fact. It's a m 예, 그 정도만 하죠. 이제 뭐 질문 굉장히 그 자아가 강하신 분은 손을 드실 수 있을 것 같은데 이 시간에 안 드실 것 같은데요. 그죠? 그래서 Reverend Rainus, would you please come and give us closing prayer? Thank you so much. Sure. Yeah. Shall we pray? Dear God, thank you that you challenge us 
and that we can live in that life of challenge, challenging and that we can and expand our minds, be it with questions, be it with knowledge and new insight. We thank you for that. My prayer this afternoon is that what I understand from this lecture is that integrity is so important. Help the church to regain its integrity. And with that integrity of the Bible and the integrity of Jesus, that we go forth and do the mission that is the expansion of the kingdom of God. We pray for him who you sent to lecture to us this today and to preach to us. I pray that you will go with him, his ministry, his life and his field of uh, influence there in America and all over the world. Thank you for everyone that was here and I pray that you will bless them and send them uh, to out to be people of the kingdom. Amen. Uh, 오늘 그 세문한 교회에서 우리 장로님 오셨는데 두분 일어나시겠습니까? 잠깐 좀 에, 장로님 내년도 130주년 에, 그 위원이십니다. 감사합니다. <웃음> 에, 그리고 어, 오영교 장로님하고 예, 이건우 장로님 역사 편찬위원회에서 오셨는데 에, 감사합니다. 네, 감사합니다. <웃음> 에, 그리고 어, 내년도 130주년 그 위원장이신 그 홍순길 장로님 에, 감사하고요. 그래서 내년에 이그 주르하고 또 뉴브란스윅하고 세문안하고 저희 정동하고 어, 5월 어, 마지막 주간으로 알고 있습니다. 그래서 이런 프로그램을 위해서 오늘 회의도 있고 그런데 위에서 많이 기도해 주시고 어, 이 역사적인 일을 위해서 어, 계속 기도해서 좋은 역사를 만들 수 있도록. Thank you. Thank you all.